morning to everyone and uh, thank you Inigo and the uh, Basque authorities for setting up this uh, amazing conference. I never thought in my life that I would ever be opening uh, the doors of my house to 1,700 people, but that's exactly what is happening right now. Uh, because of COVID, I'm working from home, and um, and now uh, I have the pleasure to speak with, uh, with all of you. I understand from 105 different countries, which shows the interest in this initiative. And um, uh, Vice Minister Jorge Arevalo has already put the, the big picture of what are the challenges for vocational education and training. And I would like in the next few minutes to share with you, can you just confirm uh, the, the presentation is okay, right? You are seeing it now? Okay, good. So I will uh, try in the next few minutes to share with you what are our ideas of uh, pushing forward this initiative on centers of vocational excellence, the links it has with internationalization, and uh, all the actions that we are taking forward in order to support this uh, initiative. The, the, the presentation will have three main ideas. The first one is on innovation to differentiate a little bit what is science-based innovation from practice-based innovation where uh, vocational excellence has a very big role to play. Then I will explain a little bit, uh, Jorge Arvalo has already introduced the theme, but explain a little bit what are the centers of vocational excellence, what is the logic behind it and what we want to achieve. And I will finalize by telling you how at the European Commission we are thinking of uh, pushing this agenda forward uh, in terms of policy, in terms of funding, so financial support for the projects, as well as a set of support services to help those that want to embrace this uh, idea of modernizing vocational education and training and make more in touch with what is the local realities. Uh, and so the whole idea is to explain to you what we are doing and what you can expect from us in the next few years. So starting with this topic of innovation, I thought of maybe sharing with you an anecdote, but to show you how important it is to understand how innovation happens. You might know that uh, James Watt, he was, you know, the guy behind the, uh, the uh, um, Industrial Revolution. And in fact, he was not a scientist or a university professor, one of these guys, you know, in the middle of a forest trying to do some research and came up with a brilliant idea that then led to this uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, Industrial Revolution back in the 18th century. In fact, he was a repairman and he was asked to uh, repair a certain uh, pump at the time in the 1760s, where he was working at the University of Glasgow as a repairman, not as a, a scientist. And in fact, it was this uh, curiosity and this uh, uh, critical thinking of wanting to fix a problem, a practical problem that led to what was then this industrial revolution. So I just wanted to share with you this anecdote because it shows you that innovation and you know, breakthroughs can happen not necessarily because of a science drive for innovation, but because of the practical way of addressing problems uh, uh, on an everyday basis. In this respect, I'm not going to get into these details because you'll receive all the, the, the presentations, but just to tell you that there's an important distinction to be made uh, on what is science-based innovation. So, you know, the kind of you know, traditional innovation where governments or big companies get millions of uh, euros and send some bright scientists to come up with a solution for a challenging uh, societal or technological problem, that kind of science-based innovation, as opposed to the practice-based innovation of people that, you know, go out of vet schools, then go to their companies, are in a production line in any company, they see a problem, and because of their entrepreneurial attitudes and because of their critical thinking, they look at the problem, they try to come up with a solution for the problem, and they fix it. And in fact, most of the innovation, and there's some studies that show it, most of the innovation that happens is, in fact, this practical, is innovation uh, that is... Uh, 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 started by a practical need to solve a problem. And in that sense, vocational education and training has a big responsibility because the kind of people that we are uh, providing skills to are these people that then go into a shop floor, into an insurance company, a bank, uh, you know, a nurse that looks at the problem and tries to solve it in a, uh, in a different way. And this kind of innovation, vocational education and training has a very, very big role to play in. So I just wanted this first introduction 
to, uh, uh, to start what I will now explain to you on what we are doing to ensure that that is closer to what are the needs at the local level, what are the needs of small companies, small and medium-sized enterprises, what are the needs of big companies as well. You know, on a practical basis, how can we equip people in order for them to address or help society progress through innovation. So innovation, I wouldn't call it just technological innovation, but innovation in the way we address problems. So we're not talking only about technology because innovation can happen in many fields, including in the social field. And that's the kind of thing that I think uh, that has a role to play in what we are trying to do with the initiative on centers of vocational access. Now, going to the topic, of course, I don't have much time. We have a lot of documents uh, to uh, um, explain what we are doing. You can visit our website. I've put it already on the YouTube uh, uh, um, video streaming that is happening right now, but we are happy to share it with you. We have at the European Commission a website. If you just look at Centers of Vocational Excellence uh, Europa, you will find our website and you'll have a lot of information there explaining in detail what it is, what kind of activities we're trying to support and so on. So I'm going to be very brief, try to explain to you the main ideas behind it. So. Uh, the important uh, uh, message I'd like you to, to have after the short presentation is that this initiative of Centers of Vocational Excellence aims to modernize vocational education and training by making it more proactive in developing skills ecosystems in the areas where VET operates. So at the local level, ensure that vocational education and training institutions are very much uh, aligned with what are regional development strategies, smart specialization strategies, cluster strategies, so that there's a clear link on what we are providing in terms of skills and what are the real needs in the ecosystem where we are working, which is usually very local. And I'm not talking about big cities. I'm talking about small villages. It can be in Bangladesh. It can be in Nepal, wherever. But making sure that that is in touch and has a, a very active role in contributing to regional development, creating jobs that mean you know, local development, have a need in the local economy. And for this to happen, of course, VET has to get out of a bubble. It has to be very much in touch, not only with VET institutions, but also with the universities of applied sciences, with research centers, so that we can contribute to this idea of innovation that I mentioned to you in the first slide. But of course, it has to be also working very closely with companies, you know, to look at how can apprenticeships, for example, be developed, internships, working with chambers that have an important role in many countries in organizing vocational education and training, working with professional associations, with trade unions, of course, because we don't want only, you know, uh, 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 vocational education and training and skills that contribute to competitiveness, but also have a human dimension. And usually trade unions have a very important role in that respect to make sure that Quality is, for example, one of the key elements of uh, apprenticeships. But of course, we have to work with policymakers. So VET has to know what are the big strategic objectives at the regional level and be contributing to this, uh, to this dialogue. Employment services, because many of the unemployed register in employment services, it is important for the VET system to understand who are these people that are in unemployed? How can we, knowing where our region wants to go, how can we upskill and reskill these people to give them good perspectives in lives? And of course, working with regional development agencies because they are quite often the drivers of regional development. So the idea I'd like to pass with you is that this, uh, this, the centers of vocational excellence have the purpose of proactively contributing to create skills ecosystems in the areas where they are working. And for that to take place, they have to work very closely with a set of stakeholders that have a role to play in this respect. So, and what does this mean? I mean, this graph is just giving you an example of the kind of activities that we see vocational excellence centers uh, taking forward. So the yellow parts are things that we usually relate to teaching and training. So providing not only initial training for the young, but also solutions for upskilling and reskilling to make sure that people are capable, are equipped with the skills for the uh, 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 green and the digital transitions. 
And for example, now, you know, in the COVID crisis, there will be a lot of companies that unfortunately are uh, closing and will not open again because of financial difficulties. And this means that there are millions of people out there that will rapidly need some solutions to upskill and reskill so that they are prepared for new jobs that will be coming up. And vocational education and training has a very important role to play. But this is just one example of the many activities in the documents I told you we have on our website. There's a list of 25 typical activities that we see, not all of them in all vocational centers, but some of them are usually present when we see vocational excellence. And in the documents we shared with you, you can find them there. So I'm not going to go through these details, but the key idea is that VET has a role to play in regional development, creating skills ecosystems, and for that it has to engage with a series of actors and perform a certain level of activities. This is what is behind the concept. Now, you might ask, okay, so why do we need these platforms of centers of vocational excellence? So although the main objective is to help at the regional level or at the local level, this transition from the education system to the labor market and work very closely with the stakeholders. What we know from experience and Erasmus Plus, you know, the, the, the symbolic program at the European level is a good example of it, that collaboration is the mother of all, uh, uh, you know, all progress in the sense that although the bus country might be very good in their vocational system and might have the vocational system contributing to innovation, I'm sure the Basques recognize that by getting uh, and collaborating with the Dutch, with the Germans, with the Danes, with the Italians, with the Spanish, that they can learn much more from uh, uh, this interchange of how to address problems. I can give you an example. The Basques are extremely good in helping with entrepreneurship activities and uh, incubators so that the learners from the VET system have the skills and the willingness to create their own company. The Dutch are very good in, for example, establishing these business education partnerships. And uh, what we want is that although the ultimate goal is to develop skills ecosystems at a local level, they're going to do it by collaborating with other entities in other, other vocational centers in other countries, and together they will learn from each other. And that's what we've been trying to do uh, with Erasmus+. Plus. And this leads me to the final part of my presentation, where I'd like to tell you what we are doing. First of all, I'd like to mention that what we are doing with the Centers of Vocational Excellence is not an isolated activity, because you cannot just you know, come up with an idea and think that it will uh, flourish. In fact, it is part of a wider uh, policy drive at the European uh, Union level that takes into account you know, the European pillar of social rights, which has a fundamental principle on uh, providing people with opportunities for lifelong learning, to engage in uh, training and education throughout their whole lives. It has to do, for example, with the skills agenda that we will have adopted. We already have one in place, but we'll have a renewed skills agenda, hopefully adopted on the 1st of July. I invite you to be attentive to what is coming out from the European Commission, because we'll have a new skills agenda coming up, which will give a strategic vision of where Europe should go in order to equip people with the skills for these big transitions coming ahead, so both the green and the digital transition. We have other policy initiatives like a EU uh, a coordination of vocational education and training policy. We'll have the European education area coming up. We're coming up with a new digital education action plan. So what I want to tell you is that this COVE initiative should be seen in this wider context of a policy drive at the European level in order to support people and empower people, both young and the adults, with the skills to have decent quality uh, jobs in the future and in the present. The way we are doing it, so not only a policy drive, but we're also putting the money where our talk is. And in that sense, last year, we had the first call of pilot projects on centers of vocational excellence. And we are very fortunate to have excellent applications. These applications are managed by the executive agency uh, that is managing these projects. And my colleague, Michel Grombier, will give you more details on what they, exactly they are doing. So just to tell that we work very closely with the agency, with other services of the European Commission uh, in order to take this forward. But last year, to test the idea, to see to what extent the market 
uh, felt that there was a need for initiative of this type. We launched the Erasmus call. We had a lot of applications and we selected five projects. I've put them in the slide for you. I'm not going to get into detail because you'll hear about them uh, in the rest of this conference, but you have all the links there with the, uh, with the websites if you want more details. But we supported this and these are kind of pioneering projects that are taking forward the ideas that we put forward on the Centers of Vocational Excellence and are doing something about them. So this is what you'll hear about today. Just to tell you that not only in 2019 we launched a call, in 2020 we further developed the concept and we launched another call. And Michelle will give you details on uh, more details on what we are doing with this call of 2020. We cannot give you a lot of details because we're still in the process of analyzing the applications. But one of the remarkable uh, uh, elements I'd like to share with you, and it's very much in tune with the 105 countries that are today participating in this conference, is that this initiative has attracted uh, attention from many parts of the world. And in fact, in the applications we received this year, we had 52 countries in the applications for Centers of Vocational Excellence, bringing together almost 1,300 organizations from all over the world. It's remarkable, 1,300 companies, vet centers, universities, small and medium-sized enterprises, all coming together in projects asking to be funded and supported by the European Commission because they want to take this uh, uh, idea ahead. And we had uh, applications, well, partner, associated partners from many parts of the world, from Canada, Kenya, Singapore, Tunisia, Uganda, the US, Australia, from all over the world. And I think this is remarkable because it shows the potential of the initiative also to establish long-term partnerships in this idea of providing excellent vocational education and training to people anywhere in the world. But as I said, my colleague will give you more details. The final slide I have to share with you is to say that I showed you in this last part that we have this policy drive, you know, the skills agenda, vocational education and training policy at the European level and so on. And we also have financing, we're supporting what we are saying with real money. And the third element that I'd like to share with you is that not only that, but we're also providing technical expertise and a set of support services that is still being uh, uh, developed. We are working very closely with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission to see how we can provide excellent service in this respect. But just briefly to tell you that you can count on our support with a set of support services that will have three pillars. The first one has to do with knowledge sharing, where we will collect all the evidence that is out there. You know, what will be the green skills needs of tomorrow? How to best address the low skilled, the group of low skilled people in Europe that never had an opportunity to finish upper secondary education? How can we do it? So all a, a, a set of elements that are based on science, evidence, research, that we'll try to include in this knowledge sharing. So a sort of intelligence hub where if you want to know anything about human capital development, regional development, that's where you should go. Then we'll have another hub that has to do with networking and collaboration, where we'll bring partners together from all over the world to share experiences among themselves, see how they are addressing a particular problem, you know, of rural development in India or of, you know, uh, artificial intelligence somewhere else. So they can share experiences and collectively enrich what we are doing in vocational education and training. And the last hub, the third hub, which has to do with information and support, providing information on funding opportunities, providing tools for self-assessment, to analyze the local ecosystem, to identify who are the preferential partners. So this is the, the third pillar. So to, to tell you, to summarize what I wanted to tell you today, that innovation happens at many levels, and VET has an important role to play in it. Unlike what many people think, that innovation and research is only for academia, in fact, VET and we have multiple examples of this, has an important role to play. Second, that this Centers of Vocational Excellence operates at two levels, the local level and this transnational level in which we want to bring people that are working on the same ideas together from all over the world. And the third element is that you can count on the EU support if you want to embrace in this journey of uh, providing people and empowering people with the skills for decent jobs and also for fulfilling lives. So thank you very much. And once again, thank you also to Technica and the five pioneer pilot projects that are helping us take this idea forward. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a successful event. Thank you.
there was a specific question for you, which was how the European Commission can support for skills intelligence activities through what tools? What about the skills intelligence based on big data analysis? Thank you. Thank you, Inigo. Very interesting question. I would like to, to mention that in this respect, uh, the European Union has been doing quite a lot. And I would like to emphasize the excellent work that the agency in Thessaloniki, you might have heard of CEDEFOP. Uh, I would suggest you go on Google and just search uh, CEDEFOP skills panorama. And then you'll see under their the website the immense amount of uh, information that is available, you know, at the sectoral level, at the national level. Uh, what are the, the, the skill needs of the future? What are the trends? You'll see very interesting information uh, on this CEDEFOP site. So CEDEFOP, uh, you just search on it in, in Google. Skills Panorama, they've got skills indexes for each country where they analyze certain elements and indicators of how well prepared the country is for the skills challenges, the transitions from the education sector to the labor market, the utilization of skills. And uh, I would say that, uh, of course, we are working and you'll see that in the skills agenda that we are going to adopt uh, in the beginning of July, there's a new impetus and also working on what you mentioned, the uh, 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 big data and analyzing job offers and so on. We are working on this. You'll see the skills agenda will have a specific uh, reference to this. I, I cannot say what is in the details of the skills agenda at this stage, but please have a look at it. And I would strongly recommend you go to the CEDEFOP site. It's uh, a particular agency that we have looking at vocational education and training um, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, where you will find a lot of information already in, uh, in uh, although we are, as I said, still working to improve that and ensure that uh, all the stakeholders in Europe are aware of what our future skill needs, what uh, what skill uh, exists there. And also we have another important launch, which you'll see also in the skills agenda, which has to do with Europass. And this Europass initiative will also, once again, make this link between the education sector and the skill needs so that people also, in terms of guidance, people that are thinking of what profession they'd like to take, what kind of education and training they'd like to take, through the information that Europass uh, will provide, will have some guidance on understanding where job opportunities will be in the future and so on. So I hope this answers the question, but I'm happy if you send me an email or on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. If you send me any kind of question, I'll be happy to answer if I can. Thank you very much, Inigo. Thank you, Joao, for your answer.